Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm going to talk to you today about a library called Sparkle. It's a library for data visualization uh, using a Scala service, and uh, we also have a connected uh, D3 uh, front end. Uh, we're open sourcing it, so uh, I'm excited to be talking about it today for the, the first time. So I'm, I'm Lee Migdal. I uh, am currently employed by Nest uh, Labs. We make those cute little thermostats. Uh, Google bought us, so I'm now part of Google. I also uh, uh, advise TypeSafe on the side, but uh, the opinions you're going to hear in the talk today are my own. I'm sure if any Google Nest or TypeSafe people are here, they will be quick to tell you that this has nothing to do with them, uh, and this, uh, probably they disagree with me. Uh, I have uh, worked at a handful of other companies, some startups that have done well, some startups you haven't heard of. Uh, I've been, um, more importantly for this audience, I've been uh, a Scala fan and a Scala user for quite a long time, at least 2007, maybe a little earlier. Um, I've you know, been using Scala for a while, interspersed with um, you know, bouts of uh, madness, I mean uh, management, uh, and then back, uh, back to Scala. But this is a project I've been working on for a while, and yeah, I'm really excited to get to tell you guys about it. Uh, so uh, I'll talk a little bit about motivation um, for why we're doing data visualization and this particular project. Uh, I will uh, share some demos. I'll spend a bunch of time talking about the, uh, the architecture of the system and especially the protocol, uh, one of the more interesting, interesting parts, I think. Uh, just in case people get too bored, I'll show some more demos, uh, and then I'll conclude with some more thoughts about how this fits into big data stacks and uh, invite people to uh, uh, participate. So first of all, why, you know, why do data visualization? Well, I guess why did this stuff come to be? Uh, I was doing a bunch of performance work, uh, and uh, you, know, you get these lists and numbers, right? They're hard to read. Um, uh, so I'll show you a graph of this later, but you know, our minds are just tuned to absorb information visually. 20%, 30%, significant percentage of our brains is visual processing. We're not so good at the symbols. So, uh, and why did we start making a library? There are some other ways to make graphs. Uh, I, I think uh, particularly for the performance uh, work, it was uh, very common to find that we wanted some interaction with the data. The interesting parts of the data were not obvious at first, right? We had some perhaps server performance data, and you want to kind of zoom around and see what's interesting. And once we started to do that, um, you know, then you realize, well, you, maybe there was this uh, D3 thing that was quite popular in the, in the browser community, um, you know, but you want to be able to handle data that's too big for that. And then once the system started to get rolling well, um, you know, it turns out that it's nice to write uh, uh, data transformations, not just in JavaScript, uh, but as I think Dean was talking about uh, uh, earlier, uh, the, uh, you know, Scala turns out to be a wonderful language for doing data, data work, data transformations. So uh, the nice thing is, uh, after doing some uh, early work and some internal prototypes and internal dashboards, uh, Sparkle is now being, over the last six months, uh, a few of us have been now rewriting it to make it more modular and more generally useful. Uh, and, uh, you know, the good thing about that is, you know, now you can, too, start to play with uh, this stuff. Um, uh, it uh, was originally, the idea, the original idea was to do these ad hoc graphs. So, uh, you know, you can just point, uh, I had a little launcher, you just point it at a CSV file or a directory of files and it will pop up a graph for you. And then if you start doing that, you'll, you'll discover that, well, the rest of your team would like to see the graphs more readily. So maybe you want to uh, convert that ad hoc graph into a dashboard. Uh, and, uh, you know, so we've been starting to do that and starting to see uh, beyond that how, how this sort of visualization server technology fits with big data. Um, uh, and
and uh, you know, really it's designed to be flexible at this point. So, uh, and in fact, if you use it twice a day, it makes your teeth really white. It's great. Nobody's getting my jokes. Okay. Um, let, me, uh, let me show you a little, uh, a little demo just to give you a feel for what's, what's going on here. Uh, so, uh, so this is, this is the, uh, that same data that you saw uh, earlier in symbolic form. And, you know, boy, graphs are great. Uh, it's, you can really understand what's going on. And, and the, the thing that uh, made it fun was as soon as we got the graphs, and then you can kind of zoom around and uh, explore things. Right, so this is uh, literally that same data, again, just a CSV file that you, you read in, and it pops up the, the graph for you. Uh, I'll do a couple more uh, just uh, uh, basic graphs, just so you can get a feel. Here's one that's a little more interesting. So this has two axes. Uh, it doesn't show up all that well, but uh, so uh, you know we're looking at histograms, uh, you know latency histograms. I think this was actually some some database uh, uh, load testing we were doing, and you know you can see the uh, the 90th percentile and the 99th percentile as well as some counts. Um, actually, if people have ideas on how to uh, visualize latency uh, histograms. Uh, I'd love to talk to you afterwards. I, I think um, uh, we could come up with better visualizations yet. Uh, and then, uh, you know, quickly what we found was, uh, again, after you do this, these first couple of graphs quickly, then people want to see these things running continuously. So here's another one. Uh, this is those same two graphs, and it zooms together, um, you know, and you can resize stuff if you want. Hopefully the back button might work. And so it's just fun. Um, uh, and... Uh, I guess I, the first thing I just want to get across is once you stop doing static graphs and start doing graphs that you can interact with, you never really want to go back. It's just too much fun. Um, and it's too easy to want to go find the interesting parts of your data set and go, and go dig through them. Uh, and so that was sort of the initial thing. And this is the base. And then, you know, the, the nice thing about the system now is not so much the rich set of graphs that are already there. There aren't so many yet. But uh, it, that it's all uh, customizable. Uh, it's all just bits of, bits of code that you can extend to do what you'd like. So um, uh, to... Uh, Create a graph like that is uh, is really simple. Um, here is the code. Uh, you know, you can see it's uh, you know you just a little bit of declarative JavaScript. You put in the title and and the label. Uh, you specify which which data you wanted. This came from a file called epochs.csv, and there was a if you remember back a couple of slides. You know, there was probably a column in here uh, p90 or p99. So that was uh, that. That was all you had to do. Okay, now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about how this works, right? Um, uh, and how it works is interesting, um, uh, both um, well because it's interesting for people like us to know how things work, uh, but also to understand how you can divide up and use bits and pieces of the technology as you choose. Uh, so, uh, so I'm sorry. Let me let me just kind of run through. These are the basic modules. So uh, we start by uh, loading the data into the system. Then then Sparkle has some kind of a fast data store that acts as a cache, at least maybe a maybe a permanent one. Uh, then there's some application server that uh, consumes the incoming data and then produces 
uh, transforms the data on demand and then produces a, uh, a stream of data, uh, a, a reactive, uh, in fact, this whole process should be, uh, should be a stream. So the data coming in is a stream, the data coming through is a stream, uh, and I promised uh, Jonas that I would say reactive streams many times, so uh, that gets me at least a few. Um, in fact, if somebody would count for me, maybe tell me at the end how many times I get. Um, so uh, one of the interesting parts is uh, the protocol. Um, uh, I think a lot of people who have played with data visualization before, you know, it, you always end up doing a, a sort of custom one-off thing to transfer some data back and forth between uh, the server and the client. Maybe you just transfer a block of data and call it done. Uh, but there are some really interesting issues, and what we're trying to do is make a general protocol here so that many clients can be written, not just this D3 one that, that uh, I showed you a little bit of before. So. Uh, uh, let me um, uh, explain how this maps, how those architectural pieces map to machines, right? So in the, in the simple case, when you're just doing something ad hoc, you run a little command, you know, sg minus files of your, your directory and you're done. All the modules run on one, one machine and then, uh, you know, you just run the app uh, and uh, point the browser uh, at the right port. Um, uh, but uh, the modularization effort, the whole purpose of it was, well, okay, you want to run this thing for your work group, you want it to be running all the time, maybe you have more data, or maybe you just don't want to be uh, worried about it when one machine goes down, so maybe you can dice things up into multiple machines. And that's, this is a common way that will, we, I, I mean, you can set it up both ways, we've done both. And I'll talk later about some big, big data uh, uh, possibilities as well. So, uh, so now I'll talk a little more about some of, the, some of these pieces I've quickly summarized. Uh, I want to talk first about the protocol, um, uh, partly because I think it's the most interesting to people, um, uh, and uh, partly because I just didn't want to run, up, run out of time. If I went left to right, I was afraid I'd run out of time. So uh, the protocol is, uh, it's a streaming, uh, reactive streaming protocol um, uh, designed for, uh, you know, for web sockets. Um, uh, it's uh, uh, JSON encoded. So, uh, you know, we maybe we'll do a binary version later, but, you know, keep it simple first. Um, uh, there's an HTTP access layer uh, as well, although the HTTP layer, of course, doesn't support the streaming features, it's just the, the basic data. But the nice thing about it is it's, um, uh, you know, it's, it's documented, right? Here's a, a link from the talk I just clicked on. Uh, this is now all public that you can, you can read. Um, uh, you know, feel free to browse this later, but there's a whole protocol spec here. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I think that's, that's partly what makes it interesting. Uh, if we visualization people could start sharing stuff, I think that would be a big win. Okay, so the, the, I'll dive a little more into how that, that interesting uh, parts of the protocol work. It's pretty simple, uh, carried over WebSockets. There's kind of two layers below that, uh, a distribution layer for uh, matching requests with responses and possibly um, uh, routing, and then the, the sort of core uh, messages for uh, requesting data to visualize and then delivering that data. Uh, here's the, that outer distribution layer, uh, you know, request ID just to, to tell you what, uh, again, to match requests with responses, traces just for debugging, realm for scoping, so you could potentially do proxying, um, uh, and then uh, um, uh, message type uh, and message, just the, the, uh, the body of the uh, embedded Sparkle data. The, the idea is that this, you could also embed other JSON encoded protocols over the same sockets using the same distribution layer. So then looking at the Sparkle layer, there's a, a handful of messages that are sent up to the server to request messages, request data, and then a handful of messages that come down to the client um, uh, to carry the data and, and um, uh, respond to requests. Uh, 
So here's, here's roughly the data flow. Let's walk through how that would work. Okay, so the client says, I really want to visualize some of that data. You know, some user sitting there saying, I want to look at the data. Uh, so it sends up. Uh, this stream request message, right? Uh, and then the server, uh, in the hopefully successful case, uh, responds with uh, a streams message. The streams message is essentially the, the, uh, the head of uh, a, a number of data streams in the head and tail sense. It's the front of the data stream. Uh, and it will include uh, the first graph that you see. So, uh, so this flow uh, is sufficient to do a static uh, graph, uh, and in fact would work over HTTP. Those, those earlier examples I showed you, uh, I, those actually went over web sockets, uh, but they could just as easily have gone over HTTP. Uh, but here we're in the, um, uh, at the reactive streams, con I mean the Scala Days conference. Um, uh, uh, so we're going to talk about the streaming case, which I think is a lot of fun too. So, uh, so if you request some data and the transformation that's sitting in the server decides, you know, it's time to send you some more, maybe it's generating data on its own or more likely it's looking at some of its data sources coming from sensors in the world or input from, from uh, latency, new latency timestamps, etc. Um, uh, and then it decides to send some data down to uh, the client and it continues to send, so it sends this second message, this update message, uh, and it just keeps uh, sending those update messages forever. Boy, I don't know, is that gonna be a problem if we just keep sending them forever? We'll have to ask Victor. Um, uh, but fortunately, um, uh, uh, it won't send them forever, it's actually gonna stop after a while because uh, the stream request includes along with it a, uh, an indicator of how many items of data, uh, not how many messages, but how many individual data items uh, are going to be sent. So if the, if the uh, client asks for, you know, perhaps this represents 10,000 points, if the client has asked for, a st I only want 10,000 points to fit in my, my buffer, that's all that's going to, you know, and then it's going to stop. The server will stop sending. Um, uh, and unless the client then sends up a second request uh, over the same stream, referencing the same stream, saying, okay, I'd like some more, I'd like to request some more items, uh, in which case the server will then respond with, thank you very much, I received your request, and then the flow of update messages can continue. Reactive. Okay, so uh, then, um, uh, I, oh, I wanted to make another point that the, um, uh, these requests are multiplexed in the protocol over the same socket. Uh, so, uh, although, uh, so here we're gonna make two requests, uh, and although the data in the streams is uh, ordered, uh, uh, and you know must stay in order. The um, the res the uh, data between streams is interleaved, right? And uh, so we we'll need to keep track of IDs so that we can demultiplex things on the client. But that gives the server the freedom to respond more quickly with whatever data it has that's available. So in this case, we sent the. Uh, I guess the bluish stream first, uh, request first, but the purple stream came back, uh, and then the blue. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, what the actual protocol messages look like. It's a really simple protocol, um, uh, but, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I hope worth uh, standardizing. So here's, uh, here's the basic um, flow of a request. So again, this body inside the distribution layer is, you know, the, the type of this is that stream request. Uh, here's our uh, reactive streams, uh, you know, item count. Uh, and we're gonna request that we want uh, some set of, um, uh, some source of data. We're going to transform it a little bit, and this is the range of data we want. Uh, and then this is controlling, uh, well, and since in this case we were specifying that we wanted the source data to be summarized, to be shrunk down, 
um, this is where we're going to specify, you know, how, how much shrinking we would like. Typically, this is going to be the number of pixels you have or, or, or some, something close to that. Uh, so then the response that comes back, uh, the streams, remember the head response, right, has, has to carry this ID for the stream. Uh, in this case, the, the data coming back is a, uh, a key value in this case, a time series. Time series very common in this world. Uh, uh, you could send back just values, but here, uh, uh, you know, key values. And then that, that's the head of the stream. Uh, I'm not shown here. I have the uh, the the update message. It looks very similar to this. Uh, it carries again a, a stream ID and a block of data. Okay, so does that that gives hopefully a basic idea of a fairly simple uh, JSON encoded protocol. But um, you know we're trying to do the work of carefully. Uh, clarifying the design decisions and the bounds of that protocol so that multiple clients can be written against this, this uh, protocol and potentially multiple servers. Okay, so now I'll walk through, uh, since I still haven't run out of time, fortunately, I'll walk through a little more of the architecture for you. I'll try to do it reasonably quickly. We have a couple more demos at the end. So loading the data. Right, I talked about how you could load the data in from uh, CSV and TSV files. Also in the, the open source drop is uh, a, uh, a loader that works on uh, Kafka, uh, reading Avro encoded uh, Kafka files. Um, there's an HTFS bulk loader not yet in the tree. That should be in soon. Uh, I was planning to do a, um, a, a netcat, uh, you know, a, a quick demo where you could you know, grep and then cat the data to the server. I thought that would be fun. Uh, I'll, for the next time I talk, I'll, have, I'll try to have that demo ready. Uh, but, but again, uh, all of the loaders uh, support uh, reactive streams uh, so that they produce a, uh, a thing that other people can observe saying when the, the data, uh, when new data has arrived so that the uh, end visualizations can update if they so choose. The storage model uh, is uh, uh, column-oriented. Um, that is, the store must provide to the rest of the system a column-oriented uh, interface. Uh, that's convenient for building uh, uh, a perform performance stores, or often column stores for this, this kind of thing. Uh, of course, you can build it any way you want. You just have to expose that API. Uh, the data is immutable. You might um, uh, you typically append uh, only. Uh, of course, remove for operational reasons, but not, not to mutate in place. There's uh, included both a RAM and, uh, more interestingly, a uh, Cassandra-based uh, backend uh, uh, for this uh, cache of data so that you can really store you know, as much data as you would like. The, uh, the code for it, um, uh, you know, to implement a new storage is not hard. Uh, just, just to give you the idea, you know, the, the columns are organized in uh, folders called, called here data sets. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, the store API really just has to support a little bit of metadata, a little bit of navigation, and then, you know, give me a column. Uh, in response to a request. Of course, everything's uh, uh, you know, asynchronous. Uh, I hear that's very trendy as well. And then uh, having received a column, having produced a column, then the column needs to uh, provide a way to um, uh, uh, you know, query the actual data. So for a key value uh, kind of column, uh, you know, it's basically it's a range request. And uh, the thing that it will produce is, uh, again, a stream. Uh, in this case, we're using the, uh, the RX, uh, uh, Scala, RX Java Scala stuff from, from uh, Netflix and Eric Meyer. Um, 
the, uh, and that's the, the advantage of producing it as a stream, of course, is then uh, the transformations, the, the, the data that ultimately the data that's going to go to the visualization client can start producing uh, immediately as data uh, is pulled out of the store off disk. There's no need to wait. Um, uh, and uh, uh, that's important because, you know, we're trying to do interactive visualizations here, and so latency really does matter. Okay, so then the basic API that uh, visualization clients get to use, you know, the basic idea is you select your sources, you select some columns, and then you're going to apply some transforms to it. You can select the columns directly. Um, as you saw in that protocol example, it was literally the, you know, a string containing you know, this path to this column. Uh, but the protocol uh, and the implementation also allow a, uh, a customization layer. You can implement a uh, class and name the class in the uh, uh, configuration file and then provide a, uh, a custom way to select what the source data is for your visualization. Maybe you want to make a custom thing for your application. You know, if you're doing server latency, you want just the, you know, the red servers or just the servers that had errors and give me all of those columns in a block. And so it's, it's um, quite possible to select them, those, those uh, and then define that custom selection in, the, in both the protocol and in the, um, the uh, server implementation. So then, um, then the idea now is we're going to get the data off the storage, uh, but we're not just going to deliver the data raw to the visualization client. It's not just spinning off the disk and going to the client, right? If you have too much data, you have a, a million data points or even a hundred thousand, it's kind of a lot to send to the client. It's a lot of network traffic. It's painful for the browser to absorb. So um, uh, the idea is in general, we're going to be shrinking that data down, but really we can be running arbitrary transformations um, uh, as long as those transformations can run pretty fast. So there's a set of sort of uh, 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 standard transformation, standard kind of uh, aggregation transformations built in. Um, uh, there's, there's the raw trans, which does nothing, um, but more commonly people will summarize uh, in some form or another. Uh, but uh, again here, the, um, you know, this effort over these last uh, six months or so has been very much to modularize and parameterize these things. So, uh, you know, very commonly you, you build custom transformations for particular applications that understand what, you know, your server latency means for your servers or in whatever domain you're going to be in. Uh, and those custom transformations are first class. Uh, you know, once they are in the system, they are um, uh, avail addressable in the protocol, and um, you know, in fact, they override any. You can override any standard transformations if you if you so choose. And uh, you know, on a bunch of these, I've kind of put the links in too. So feel free to click through on those if you grab a copy of these slides later. They go right over to that the the, the appropriate section of the the docs. So um, uh, we talked about streaming. Okay, then now this isn't a JavaScript uh, uh, conference, so I'm not going to spend too much time talking about that. But uh, and actually, in the this last period. Um, uh, the JavaScript client has seen the least attention. Um, uh, there's a fair bit of old JavaScript stuff that still needs to get ported over to this new version. Um, but, uh, but, you know, it's, it's already pretty functional, um, and I think it's now that the, uh, the protocol and, and service have stabilized, uh, it's time again to do some more work on the, the front end. Um, so it's uh, D3, as you saw, it's quite easy to add new things and, and include um, sort of new kinds of uh, visualizations. I think that's the, the thing that's fun about this is you can really explore making new and interesting visualizations. You know, maybe that 
you have an idea for that latency thing that was bothering me a few slides ago and, and want to help on that. But the, the, it's, um, uh, it's nice. D3 is, uh, uh, you know, bo both ends now are designed for programmers to extend. Uh, so this particular JavaScript client, you know, is uh, obviously designed to use the server API. It's also, um, you know, usable standalone. Uh, and we do that all the time for testing. Oh, time for another demo. Woohoo! Okay, so what I did here was I just fired up the, uh, uh, the, the Scala REPL. Uh, and what I'm going to show you is just doing a little plot. So here we make a little sine wave. And we say... With a little luck, there we see our graph. So, um, I, you know, I don't know about you, I'm kind of excited about that. You know, now you like all the time you get these little chunks of data in the, you know, in, in the REPL and you're trying to figure something out. Now you can just apply your, you know, your favorite Scala functions and produce graphs. And, you know, again, it's got all the zoomy stuff. Um, so let me show you just a little more of that. Okay, you'll notice it sort of just popped up magically. Well, hopefully magically. That, that's you know that's web sockets, right? So this, the plot controller here is is listening on a web socket for new uh, new data to come down. Uh, what else did I have here? You want one more? No. You know, you can zoom in, see all the interesting bits of the data. The zooming thing is really fun. Try the zooming thing. Try it at home. Okay. Uh, so this WebSocket, the thing I show you where it pops up with the WebSockets is fun, but let me show you some, another bit about the streaming. I think maybe a little more fun. Okay, so we're using the observables library here, which maybe isn't so familiar to people. Uh, so this creates an asynchronous stream that generates uh, a tick, uh, you know, an integer, uh, in this case, every uh, 100 milliseconds. Uh, and then we'll, we'll map that over to here. So we'll convert the, that. So this is, this is the sign stream, but, you know, going on forwards in time indefinitely. Um, uh, uh, and uh, now uh, it's not actually producing until someone uh, subscribes to that stream, but uh, let's do that by creating a plot of it. Okay, so now here you can see the, uh, you know, the data coming in every 100 milliseconds. Cool. I worked all airplane ride on the way here on that. So, um, so uh, you know, this is just uh, uh, just fun right now. But you know, already you can see how bringing data in live, right? That could be useful, you know, as your results arrive. Um, so, just this sort of scrunching version of the demo. I'm sure we'll do more. Uh, you know, maybe you want a sliding window for some uh, performance thing. Uh, uh, you know, you want to see the data just sort of moving across the screen. There's a lot of things to explore here, uh, and I think that that next phase is going to be pretty fun too. 
kill it and it stops. Whew, it's real. Okay, uh, so um, uh, let me um, let me now talk about how this is sort of the work group scenario. And uh, but like uh, I, I, we, like I suspect many of you have uh, played around with some of these big data stores. You got some Hadoop thing lying around. Um, uh, you know, how would this visualization stuff uh, fit in with that, right? Uh, well, one way is, uh, you know, very simple and just, you know, this, now that it's modular and scalable and you got this Cassandra thing, you know, you can just make this storage thing as big as you want, right? Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and then uh, you can have a huge store uh, and then typically serve up uh, just a small slice of that data, right? Maybe you've got uh, metrics for every one of your thousand servers, um, you know, at high resolution, filling up your store, but then you display, um, you know, you display only, only one or two of those at a time. Uh, the other thing is maybe you've got one of these, um, uh, uh, you know, big fat stores, I mean, really big stores. Uh, you can run your map, your batch uh, operations on that store, and then export the uh, the stream through this this loader, uh, and then um, and then cache the. Uh, the, uh, the 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 results of the batch in the fast store, uh, so that uh, you can do all the interactive uh, uh, zooming around kinds of thing there, uh, and really y you can do a hybrid, right? Because you know this this uh, system is transformations is designed for things that will be fast and run on you know, medium sizes of data. Um, uh, so you can do some of your, your work here on the back end. You, know, you, can, you can decide where you want to split it. Um, so Sparkle is, um, is open source. It's Apache open source. It's wonderful to be contributing back uh, some open source. You know, we're using a bunch of open source libraries. There's a lot of really great stuff out there. Um, you know, just to shout out to, you know, the, the Scala stuff, Scala test and Scala check. Excellent. Uh, we're using Spray, um, uh, Spire. Um, uh, I don't know if any of the Spire folks are here, but we've just started using that. That's very promising. Uh, I, reactive Streams, I hear that's big. Uh, it, on the JavaScript side, we've tried to stay pretty lean. Um, uh, with just a few libraries, we actually don't have in this uh, any uh, streams, re any JavaScript streams library. Uh, not quite, if you have strong opinions, or, or especially good education and strong opinions on which uh, JavaScript streams library to use, I'd love to talk to you afterwards. Uh, but really, you know, I'm just excited to be getting this out there. Um, I'd love, I'd love if a few of, you know, a couple of you would, um, you know, be interested enough to uh, participate. Um, you know, just to share the ideas about how to do visualization stuff. Uh, by all means, use the protocol, and or or at least be inspired by it if you're if you're looking at doing data visualization work. The server stuff is very extensible. Um, the JavaScript stuff is really really um, uh, fun to play with. Uh, and a note from my sponsor um, that um, uh, we are hiring at uh, Nest for people to work on Scala. We are hiring for people to work on this project uh, and other projects at Scala. And Google, of course, is hiring. Uh, uh, all across the company as well. Uh, in case you need some inspirational ideas for things, so here's a handful of inspirational ideas of things you might want to add, things I've wanted to add, but I haven't had time. Um, uh, you know, you can add streaming loaders of various kinds, maybe do this, this Netcat demo thing. I, I think it wouldn't be too hard. Um, uh, you know, you can add new storage formats. Um, uh, Cassandra is nice, but not optimal. Um, if you have another favorite one, have at it. Uh, Google, I, I hear that Google stuff is really great. We should use that too. 
Uh, it's very easy to, it's designed to be embedded and, you know, it's currently running the uh, spray stuff. You can configure an additional routes if you have, uh, you want to run the server and add some APIs to it, you can do that. Uh, transforms and selectors, as we saw, were extensible. Um, you know, have fun with the, with the protocol. And uh, uh, it's pretty interesting to try exploring the things you can do with visualization with both, you know, a client side uh, and a server side available. Uh, I think that's going to be, you know, so much of the visualization community is focused just on client side. It's pretty interesting to see what we can do with both. So I, I found that part a lot of fun. Uh, a few things that uh, are particularly on, on uh, kind of my or our internal list is obviously more of this WebSocket stuff. Uh, the performance side, there's going to be a lot of work there. Spark is going to be pretty interesting. Um, it seems like there's some obvious synergies between that we could use where a visualization layer will be useful for, for Spark folks. And, you know, really I'm just excited to, uh, as, as more people, um, you know, internally and eventually uh, externally start using thing to sort of collect up more interesting visualizations to share with people. So, uh, you know, if you're, uh, if you want a fully polished kind of replacement for, you know, you don't what you want to save on your Tableau, this isn't ready for you yet, right? Um, this is, but it, I think at this point it is developer ready. So if you want to start uh, uh, playing with it, uh, you know, come on in. Um, uh, this is, uh, it's all in uh, GitHub now. Uh, I've been on uh, a bunch of the recent hacks, haven't made it into master yet. I've been on vacation the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, so take a look at the Scala Days branch. Uh, and there you will also find um, uh, links to uh, these slides uh, and uh, the protocol docs. That's all I have for you guys. Thank you very much.